It's like I woke up in a parallel universe. I cannot believe the conversations that we have to have today as a society. Even polite society. There is no such thing as polite society anymore. I want to uh, play some audio we played for you earlier this week. Uh, This was uh, actually from a hearing on H.R. 490, the Heartbeat Protection Act of 2017. And uh, Star Parker was testifying in front of Congress and... Man, is she brave. Listen to this. But if you also consider in your deliberations regarding H.R. 490, the last time in American history that we were faced with hard constitutional and political questions on the civil conflict between humanity and convenience, personhood and property, justice and public opinion. Slavery was, as abortion is, a crime against humanity. Like slavery, tensions were created in a public square and in law concerning who qualified for natural rights worthy of protection. In the first 89 years of our nation's existence, it was the black slave who sought freedom and equal protection under the law, and many attempts were made to heed their cry. Today, it is the conceived person living in the womb of its mother that should be considered human with opportunity of equal protection under the law. It is ironic that while the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution in 1868 humanized slaves, the United States Supreme Court of 1973 dehumanized the life of the being in in utero, handing down a decision that reeked in ethnic cleansing to once again allow a powerful few to determine exactly who had a right to humanity. Star Parker is with us now. How much heat are you getting, Star Parker? Well, thank you, Glenn, to have me on. And frankly, that's the first interview. You are the first to actually play some of what I said in the testimony. Shut up. Mostly because of what happened after. No, seriously. (laughs) So I'm listening to it and saying, oh, so I did make my point. (laughs) Uh, No, what happened during the Q&A, I answered a question and then referred back to uh, some of the discussion that was earlier. One of the congressmen, we call him now Congressman Coward Cohen, and um, uh, because he kept throwing in welfare programs into the discussion, but he wasn't the only one. So did a protester during the time that they were actually showing a ultrasound uh, in the hearing room, first in the history of the country. You think it would be a front page news that they actually showed a ultrasound of a live in the womb a child uh, in a congressional hearing. But that said, so I then answered and addressed his um, comments about welfare and trying to, you know, delude what we were talking about and called it disingenuous to uh, combine the two issues. And he lit into me. I mean, he called me ignorant. He told me that I didn't know how to address the Congress. After the hearing was over, he came up and put his finger on my face and told me I better come to his office and apologize. So all of that, so that's what went viral. So what really got lost, and I really appreciate uh, you playing that is the actual testimony. This is very serious business. What we've yeah. been doing, you know, I, I have to tell you, Star. I am so sick of the uh, back and forth uh, viral bites that have nothing to do. I'm sorry, uh, but you and they will call me ignorant as well. Um, arguing about welfare programs when it comes to abortion is exactly the same as arguing about uh, arguing for slavery because it will destroy the economy and people will suffer. Right. Well, and that's why I had to address it, even though maybe I was a little out of order because he didn't ask me a specific question, but I wasn't addressing him. I was addressing the, the chairman who did ask me a question, chairman of the subcommittee for the judiciary on constitution and civil justice. When, you know, getting to what you're discussing earlier and how it, it, it's unbelievable the things that we have to now discuss in the public square when children are listening uh, because of the sexual matters that are coming onto the front pages, and yet they're rooted in this abortion question. When you kill in the womb, what we're doing in abortion, let's even set aside for one moment the moral, the medical, and the mental implications to abortion. Abortion feeds a narrative that women are just victims. They can't control their impulses. They can't, as you said, learn how to say no when things are inappropriate and find the language to say, excuse me, sir, but this is not appropriate, and so I'm leaving the room right now. And it's because it feeds that narrative that you can't control your sexual impulses. And so now people are sexually out of control. That's why marriage has collapsed. That's why out of that marriage births have escalated. And we, as a nation, better get a grip on this. 
Uh, otherwise, we're going to always have discussions about sexual matters in somebody else and the accusations that are coming forth that we don't even know if are true, like what just happened to the candidate who 40 years earlier, someone saying, aha, this is what you said to me. Who remembers what they said 40 years ago? So, Star, how do we... We are entering a time, and we, you know, we have the oldest Congress in the history of the United States. This is the oldest Congress ever, uh, and we are on the the edge of profound technological change that is going to make us question what life even is. And I don't mean is it life in the womb? That's a pretty easy one. Yeah. No, I mean, no, if it's a puppy no. when it's in the in the dog's womb, it's a child when it's in the human's womb. We are yeah. we're entering a time now where we're going to have to define life with AI and that's going to screw everything up. How do we get how do we get to a point to where we can have rational discussions that must be had now? Uh, that, that, that is the million-dollar question. But, you know, you just brought up a fascinating point that I'm going to have to contemplate and think about later uh, about the oldest Congress. Because you would think then there would be deep passion since they're on their senior years to argue for the most innocent in the womb because they're next. Uh, a couple of states have already passed euthanasia. Uh, we're starting to, as a, as a culture, collapse when it comes to protecting the innocent, understanding what the Constitution really means. But how do we get there? I don't, we may have to start over. It's why I fight so hard for school choice. We're going to have to, again, build a moral framework within our youth. And the only way to do that is get them out of these cesspools we call schools that indoctrinate them in secularism and put them in schools mm. where, where they're building moral framework and integrity. It, the only ones that are really trapped now in failing government schools are the very poor, the most vulnerable, who are getting lost in all of this noise, and that's why their lives are in moral chaos. Uh, so how do we get back? You replace everybody in Congress. I was surprised that after um, McCain lost the nominee, you know, the, the presidency when he ran, that he didn't just retire even at that age. What is he still doing there? Why hasn't he passed the baton to younger energy and now raking havoc even over his own? The whole thing may get to the place that we were in the 1850s, the where we just can't go on anymore and could end up in a real difficult dilemma. I think we're headed that direction. Sorry, it was interesting. Your, your commentary was really interesting in, in talking about abortion as it relates to slavery. And I think a lot of people assign their sort of moral decision making on difficult topics like this to society. And so I think even in back in the day, a lot of people who probably if they really stopped and think thought about it would think slavery is crazy. It's a crazy idea. But since society said it was accepted and it was legal, people sort of just went around, went along with it. It was a controversial issue, maybe. But they didn't want to talk about it in polite company. Yeah. Is that the what you're thing. seeing? Is that the same thing yeah. now? Because I think a lot of people who it's not people who, you know, are necessarily horrible people, but they want to avoid the tough sort of moral Big time uh, 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 examination of themselves to really right. think about whether this is right or wrong. That's right. And not only on abortion, on many issues, but yep. you're absolutely right. The same conversations we're having today, and in fact, one of the things I also said in that testimony is if you put Roe v. Wade next to Dred Scott, they read almost verbatim. They're both talking about property. They're both talking about, um, you know, the rights of, of, the, of the person who has. The, the, the rhetoric we hear from the left, even on abortion, well, if you, don't, if you don't like it, don't have one. That's the same thing they were saying during slavery. Well, well you don't have to own one. And remember, very few own slaves. Now, the narrative left is every white person is guilty of slavery because all of them had one. No, that is not true. Slavery was an elite. <laughs> you, had to, you had to have some money to own a slave. <laughs> and so they were. <laughs> um, uh, anyway, so it was very controversial. But you're right that the, the silent majority allowed this country to go 89 years and then enter into a civil war because they just didn't have the courage to speak up. You're absolutely right. They knew it was wrong. And then every time the Congress tried to manipulate around it, the same way we're hearing manipulations now around abortion, uh, well, maybe we just won't let it into the Western states. Well, maybe we can just pass this little act over here. Maybe we can. No. If it's a crime against humanity, you shouldn't be doing it, and you should do everything you can to stop it. And that's where we are even with the abortion question today, exactly where we were uh, with the question of slavery back in the day. Does it amaze you that 
Margaret Sanger uh, and all of the eugenicists back then that were trying to wipe out the black race, openly wipe them out, uh, are so uh, seemingly celebrated as friends of uh, the black community now that that's what they're standing up for. Oh, no, we're just trying to help the poor inner city black woman. It's crazy. On Halloween, they tweeted out their real agenda. Black women have abortion because you're safer than having a child. Uh, it, it's great. The, 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 the first black president of the country goes to Planned Parenthood's annual celebration. The way they kill off black children in this country, 20 million blacks have died in the womb of their mom since Roe v. Wade. And he goes, and not only does he go, then he says, God bless you. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's amazing how blinded people are to these facts. How is it that we allow ourselves to be complicit in abortion with Planned Parenthood by allowing them to get corporate welfare year after year at $520 million is what they're getting. In fact, everyone you know, everyone that's listening to us, everyone they know, everyone they know, everyone they know, know, probably 10 times, uh, may as well just hand the money straight to Planned Parenthood because it still wouldn't equal $520 million. And for some reason, we want corporate welfare out of here, but that billion-dollar corporation gets $520 million tax dollars every year to do their primary business, which is to kill offspring. Star, thank you so much. God bless. Thank you. Glenn Beck. The Blaze Radio Network.